You don't know what death is. They're all being murdered. Pray for day. Hey, you want a beer? <laughs> hey! <laughs> Twenty-six-year-old Jay Jones escaped from the Hobart State Hospital for the criminally insane last night after killing an attendant and leaving a guard in critical condition. I got you, I got you. Damn you, little creep! Will you get the hell out of here? This is your last time. Uh oh, I think the complication is developed. She won't drink anything. She hates to go to the bathroom. Get up, buddy! Ah! My God, please take me instead. Please don't hurt her. Please. Listen, to me, man. Listen to me. Women are no good. Only cause your problems, man. My mother was no good like that. Crazy. This is Kurt Rector from House of Death, and you're listening to The Hysteria Continues. And indeed you are. Welcome back to The Hysteria Continues, and this time it's Thanksgiving, or Thanksgiving, and we're heading back to the early 1980s for a little slash movie called Home Sweet Home. And uh, Nathan, I believe, this is a Nathan pick, isn't it? So uh, are you looking forward to discussing this um, not particularly well-known slasher from 81? Yes, I'm very, very excited to discuss what happens to the poor Bradley family. <gasps> yes, and all their relatives. Yep. Yep. Um, a very odd family, for sure. Well, yes, we shall be coming on to them. Uh, not literally. The oldest joke in the book, but I still can't stop making it. So, Eric, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, and this Thanksgiving I'm thankful for face paint and electric guitars. Are you? Okay. And uh, Kajikugu. Oh, yeah. Of course. So, and Joseph, uh, how are you doing? I'm quite well. Uh, it, it would appear the Bradleys have a slasher in the house. Indeed they do. Indeed they do. It's uh, it's a risk of any holiday. You've got to make sure there isn't a killer lurking around the property. So, uh, yes, we will be talking all things Home Sweet Home uh, after our usual, uh, what we've been seeing recently. But we've also, of course... This is episode 199, and you know what that means. What's coming next is the big 200. Now, we did tease last time about a very, very special episode, and we do have a special episode coming for you next time, but we have a few wrinkles to iron out for our very, very special episode. Um, So we're actually going to be having that for our ninth birthday in the end of January. So, um, But we will be teasing about that, and it's something to get very, very excited about, or maybe not. But you'll see. You'll see all will be revealed. But uh, we'll be revealing our big 200th episode. And it's it's a film that... um, Uh, Well, let's put it this way. We've talked about uh, in context, um, but we've never covered. So I think you'll be pleased. Uh, So we'll reveal that at the end of the show. Well, I think you just gave it away. Did I? (laughs) I mean, what film have we talked about in context, but we've never covered? Oh, The Day After Halloween. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) the one. Nathan. (laughs) Nathan. Right. Well, uh, first things first, let's have a chat about what we've been watching recently. So, Joseph, uh, what have you caught in the last couple of weeks? Well, I've not watched anything, honestly. However, um, since this is our Thanksgiving episode, I feel uh, I should mention, now this is non-horror, but every um, every Thanksgiving I watch Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Uh, it's one of my favorite uh, favorite movies of all time, honestly. But this year, I'm not only watching it at home on Thanksgiving, but I'm actually going to see it on the big screen. I'm so excited. Uh, it's been a lifelong dream of mine. I love the film. Uh, it's playing for one night only at the Tivoli Theater uh, on the 23rd. So I'm going. I've already got my tickets. So I think that should be a lot of fun. Uh, otherwise, no, I've, I've been so busy and trying to catch up on sleep. I haven't watched anything lately. So sorry. No worries. Well, thank you. Uh, Eric, how about you? Okay. Well, the only thing I've seen, because it's only been a week since we recorded, was I watched the season finale of American Horror Story 1984. Um, it was a mere nine episodes this time, but I, you know, my thoughts on these type of um, uh, very long TV series still remains. I think they they just feel dragged out. It was kind of hit and miss the whole series for me. Um, I thought there was very good bits, very, and there's lots of bits that just I was 
I lost interest. I I just don't see this incessant need to have multiple twists in every single episode. Um, like where characters who you think are good guys turn out to be bad guys and vice versa. And it's like, you know, can you not just sort of stop with the twists and just tell sort of a cohesive narrative, which it didn't. It just kept, it felt, uh, I saw somebody describe it as, um, it just felt very much like it was made up as they went along. And that's how I felt. Now I did love the episodes with the brief appearances by Kajigugu, which I thought was great fun. Um, but overall, I mean, it's not a series I'd ever revisit if it came out on a Blu-ray special edition. It wouldn't tempt me to buy it or anything. Um, I stuck with it to the end. I'm, I'm kind of glad I did because there was enough in it to entertain me. But overall, I just found it a bit uh, just um, it was all over the place. And uh, yeah, again, I have I mean, I only ever seen the only other series of American Horror Story I've watched was the first one. And I had exactly the same response. I thought it was had individual moments I liked, but overall it felt like it just treaded water for so long and didn't have a satisfying conclusion. So I don't know if you, I don't know, Nathan, you've seen the season finale, haven't you? Yes. Uh, I really liked this season. Um, I do get the vibe. It was made up as it was uh, going along, like you were saying, because it's just one of those things where, I mean, half the cast is serial killers. Mm. or a killer of some sort. And I'm like, are really that many killers out there? I mean, as opposed to, you know, good people? I don't know. But And also, it seems to take place in a universe where sort of anything is possible. So, Oh, yeah, ghosts just, and everything. Yeah, ghost I wanted killer. ghosts to be a homage to the forest. Do you guys think it was? <laughs> it didn't pop to mind immediately, but yes, now that you mention it, <laughs> possibly. No. But I uh, really uh, enjoyed the season. Uh, you know, I, um, I can get what Eric's saying. And I, I don't necessarily think I would find it that rewatchable because I don't really think I'd find any slasher TV series to be rewatchable. Um, I prefer, like we've said before, I just like a good 80 to 90 minutes of slasher fun. And that to me is the perfect running time for it. Yeah, well, it, it just hasn't felt like a slasher movie um, version of American Horror Story for about five or six episodes now for me. It did at the start, obviously, but then that just sort of fell it switched by the gears. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah that's where I kind of lost interest. I, I still need to watch the rest of it, but you know, once it started getting really twisty, I mean, it was kind of fun, but I don't know. I'm like Eric. I kind of wanted that cohesive story. Now, Nathan, you're, you were saying that there's you, you're not interested in a slasher TV series. Now, I should point out that um, HBO Max is coming out with a point horror anthology series where they're doing all those slasher books. Yeah, see, I would like that. Yeah, I can't wait for that. That sounds fun. Yeah, I would definitely watch that. And Joseph, you should watch um, the series if if nothing else for your favorite character because she gets more and more awesome as it goes along. Oh, yeah, I'm going to finish it. I'm just not in a hurry. Yeah, I'll probably finish it tonight. Uh, I kind of lost interest a little bit the last uh, penultimate episode. It kind of sort of was all over the place for a little bit, but uh, um, <clears throat> but like you, Eric, it, it just sort of I, I, it can start off as a slasher, uh, and it, for the first two or three episodes, uh, and as it got more and more away from that, it just it, it kind of the whole camp setting. Although they know they bring it back to it, it by that point it's become so unbelievable um, and so over the top that it kind of it doesn't really resonate, I kind of guess, is the best way mm-hmm. of putting it. So, uh, but uh, yeah, well, thank you. What, anything else? Uh, no, that was it. Apart from watching Christmas with the Cranks, starring the awesome Jamie Lee Curtis. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Right. Which Nathan described as being a bit of a horror film, and I, I, I can kind of agree. It, it was entertaining. Did you, did you watch it on a double bill with uh, House Arrest or Virus? No. I do like Virus. I know Jamie Lee Curtis, oh, I did. I did Jamie too, Lee Curtis I love hates that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is she in a house arrest? Yeah. Oh, that, is that the... It's um, her and Kevin Pollack. They get locked in a basement. Oh, yes, yes. I yes, love yes. that movie. Oh, God. <laughs> it's, fun. it's better than Christmas with the Cranks. I'm, I'm wow. telling you, the neighbors in that movie are weird. Mm-hmm. I would move out of that neighborhood immediately. Stripes agrees. Of mm-hmm. course, of course. So, excellent. Well, Nathan, uh, what have you been watching? Um, the only thing I've watched since we last recorded is I watched that movie Rattlesnake. Mm. Um, that you had seen, Justin. Yeah, I don't think I liked it as much as as you necessarily. I actually started getting very bored. I just I felt like uh, I, I, I about halfway through the movie, I kind of guessed where it was going to end up going, and I was like, I kind of wanted it to surprise me, and it never really did. It just kind of went exactly where I thought it was going to go, and I don't know. I just felt it kind of dragged for me. Unfortunately, I'm sorry to any fans of the film. I 
Um, I was just kind of lukewarm on it. Well, that's okay. You sounded really upset, Justin. The, the silence spoke volumes. I know. Well, I, I sobbed into my microphone, into my fist. Well, I mean, you did describe it as your favorite film of all time, didn't you? No, no, that's The Forest. <laughs> no, <it's not. laughs> well, anything else, Nathan? Uh, no, that's all I've seen except for American Horror Story. Okay. Well, I'll tell you, I saw a film, Nathan, which I think would be right up your alley, um, mm. much more fun than Rattlesnake, is a little film called The Cleaning Lady which uh, popped up in a box. I hadn't heard anything about it before. And I thought it was, um, from the description, from the poster, I thought it was going to be a, like a, a drama about a woman who cleans up dead bodies, you know. Like, um, but in actually, uh, surprisingly, it turned into a bit of a slasher movie. And it's. Um, I thought it was a whole lot of fun. It was kind of one of those films that took me by surprise. And uh, the basic story is about a, a woman who's having an affair with this man and she's trying to call it off with him. And uh, she runs a, I think, a kind of massage company, but not like the kind of massage companies Eric would know, but the ones where there's hey. aromatherapy and that type of thing. And then um, she employs uh, a woman who works at her building who's got a hideously, hideously uh, uh, scarred, burnt face. And she takes pity on her and um, uh, asks her if she wants to become her cleaning lady. And she does. And then you know that something's off with one of these characters. You're not quite sure which one it is. But the film uh, goes in a very entertaining direction uh, and uh, veers in the last 20 minutes or so, veers into complete slash movie territory. So uh, uh, that's from last year, I think, 2018. But uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun with that one. So any of you guys heard of that? I have, yes, because I, I have a subscription now to Now TV, and it's on their uh, streaming service, so I have been meaning to catch it. Okay. Uh, I was, I hadn't read any reviews, though, so I'm intrigued to hear that it's actually quite good. Well, I mean, I'm when I say sure it's quite... It's anything for me. It's, it's not good in the conventional sense. It's kind of good mm. in, the, in the Nathan sense, if that makes sense. Oh, that makes total sense <laughs> to me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I thought it was quite entertaining. It is, I think sometimes when you watch a film and it takes you a bit by surprise, even though it's very kind of formulaic in a lot of ways, but it, it takes you by surprise because it's actually fun. Um, whereas I can, I, I can see where you're coming from with the thing about Rattlesnake not being a fun movie. Uh, now, talking of the only other film I saw, and I don't remember if I talked about this last time or not, was The Dead Center. Did we talk about that last time? I can't remember if we did. No, you, you did because oh. you did because oh, did. Um, okay. I mentioned it's a Shane Carruth was in it and I wanted to see it. You said it was really good, actually. It's uh, that's right. No, I did. I did. Right. So I couldn't remember if I mentioned it last time. So, uh, but yeah, well, that in that case, um, the that's all I've seen horror wise in the last week or so. So, I guess that means uh, that it's uh, time for the feature presentation. Thanksgiving Day. The Bradley family and friends gather for a traditional feast to give thanks for life's bountiful blessings. And they have every reason to be thankful for their lives, because before they know it, they'll be dead. For the Bradleys have an uninvited guest. A homicidal maniac has escaped from imprisonment to satisfy his pent-up lust for murder. And he has singled out their home for his psychopathic killing spree. One by one, the revelers will be methodically stalked and served up in the butcher's holiday blood feast until the Bradleys home sweet home becomes a grisly house of horror. That's the back of the box for Home Sweet Home. Um, I don't, I think it almost makes it sound like a cannibal movie, but it's not a cannibal movie. Um, I adore this movie. I think it's absolutely wonderful in every possible way, even from the very opening scene where the guy's like, you want a beer? And he gets strangled to death for offering a beer. So, yeah, that's a interesting uh, way. And then, of course, right after that, uh, our killer, Jake Steinfeld, mows down an old lady at a crosswalk. <laughs> it's so funny when he hits her in the way it's filmed. And then afterwards, there's the blood splattered across the windshield, and we get the title card while he's laughing crazy. That was, I mean, and speaking of him, you know, he plays this role completely insane. It's such an over the top and scenery chewing performance. And, and by that, I mean it's brilliant. His performance totally works for this movie. The family itself, the Bradleys, they're one of the strangest families I've seen. They don't even seem like a family to me. They almost seem like a group of acquaintances who don't even know each other very well. I mean, most of the time, they're either wanting to just have sex or kill Mistake. I mean, that seems to be all they really discuss for the holiday. Um, Mistake is my favorite character in the movie. He's kind of this um, mime slash uh, guitarist who is constantly playing the guitar and annoying his family. 
But, you know, are they not worthy of being aggravated by him? I mean, it's not like any of them are, like, amazing people necessarily. I mean, um, the the heroine is a nice character and the little girl, too. Speaking of which, Mistake uh, actually kind of bonds with her in one scene and does, like, his magic tricks. And it was also cool that he bargained uh, to save Maria uh, of course, I don't know if offering to play the killer a song or do some magic for him was ever going to work. <laughs> but, you know, he tried. The heroine, uh, I mean, she's all right, but she's kind of a bit blah for me. I mean, she's one of the nicer characters in the movie, but she just doesn't have that fight kind of attitude that I like my 80s slasher movie heroines to have. I mean, she tries at first with when her boyfriend's alive, but it's like once her boyfriend isn't around anymore, she just falls apart completely. I did get a kick out of the end when he's attacking her and they replay that exact same scream like over and over. They got to play that one scream at least five times in the end. Um, But no, I mean, Home Sweet Home, I think, is hilariously bad. I love every minute of it. Um, Definitely worthwhile. And I think I am going to ask Joseph, what do you think of Home Sweet Home? Well, I I honestly didn't know what to expect because I'd seen this I hadn't seen it for a long time and I remember it being bad of course, but I had no idea how hilariously bad this film is. Um it's right up there now with me for, you know, like Nailgun Massacre and Boarding House. It's just so extraordinarily awful that I love it. Um I think the killer, I think that's his name, the killer. I don't know. No, it's Jay Jones, I'm sorry. Uh, Jake Steinfeld, his Jay Jones character, like you said, he's completely, completely over the top. But when you put him in the nut house with the Bradleys, he's like the most sane, if you ask me. So I think they all deserve to die. This family is so ridiculous. All they care about is sneaking off to have sex. And, you know, one of them says, OK, we've got to get rid of mistake. You know, and I know he's annoying, but he's a kid. And you're talking about like just shipping him off on Thanksgiving Day. You know, and that reminds me, how are they how are they planning to cook all this food? I mean, they're dealing with the power going out. And I like how the, <laughs> the killer, other than rip the power out, he just goes out and just kind of gingerly shuts the power off with a little switch. No one go, no one thinks to go check the switch or anything like that. Um, everybody panics. Everybody leaves. Um, everybody gets kind of like, you know, killed off as they leave the house. Um, it's just so ridiculous. And I love um, that, that all this is going on. And you get this mistake character. Um, you know, I was telling Nathan off air that mistake is both the most annoying and the most likable character in this film because he's the least um, insane of the Bradleys. I mean, this family, I'm, I can't I can't stress how crazy this family is. And I've got some background theories that I'll get into later. But overall, I mean, Home Sweet Home is just so goofy and so stupid. Um, it's just so over the top. Um, I love, I, I just, I love the scene where uh, the the guy, <laughs> the the patriarch of the Bradley family, he's going out to look for somebody or something, or he, or he's going to get something from the store. I don't remember what it is, but he he sees um, the killer's car that he stole off the side of the road, pulled off, and he, he gets out and he's kind of like saying, "Hello, anyone there?" And you're thinking, "Okay, he's going to you know be kind and help this uh, whoever this car belongs to." But no, he steals the guy's gas. He steals the gas from the car, and then he's like, "Hmm, well, I could use a new battery." So he, then he's going to steal the, the 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 battery from the car. And so while he's stealing the battery, the killer jumps on the the car, the the bonnet or whatever it is, and he crushes him. Now it's it's very similar to Madman, but this guy he deserved it. This family, I, I can't go into how awful this family is. They're they're like the worst selfish relatives of all time, and they all deserve to die. Um, but yeah, I mean, no, I mean, I got a lot more to say about this. I mean, it's just so many individual parts you could talk about. But for now, I'm just going to say a thumbs way up for me. I love this film. Great pick, Nathan. I think it's a perfect 199. Thank you, Joseph. Um, OK, I'm going to pass it to Justin. Well, the home sweet home. Well, it's a perfect Nathan gift for Thanksgiving, isn't it? Um, it's it's so over the top. I mean, the thing I was watching at this time, I was thinking, I don't think they were making a serious movie, were they? I think there's definitely uh, quite a few tongues and cheeks uh, with this. And um, I did some research, and we talk about uh, background, but uh, I, you know, I mean, this is kind of the archetypal uh, archetypal uh, quickie knockoff, isn't it? Uh, as far as kind of, it, it's a, you know, it's a. A, a quickly made slash movie sort of to capitalize on the um on the slash movie boom uh but very much i think the tongues were firmly in cheeks um i mean jake steinfield is 
is is incredibly bizarre in in this role and apparently he has no sense of humor about his performance whatsoever uh which makes me love it even more um that that opening those opening scenes were it's just pure grindhouse and so over the top the kind of the injecting pcp is sort of into his tongue um this giggling uh killer and in one scene when he's actually I think when he's watching the women, the two women in the car who are driving round and round and round for for driving, going to get all of two bottles of wine uh, for this family gathering. Um, And it sounds like he's not heavy breathing so much as basically wanking almost. He's kind of making this kind of this kind of strange kind of throaty sound while he's watching these two women. And so it's a very committed performance, um, and I, you know, it's playing on the tropes of the un- unkillable, you know, k- killer. And I think way back when, wasn't it with Angel Dust? It was kind of they they say that it was a bit like um, for nineteen eighties. It was like the bath salts of the early eighties, and so much people gave people incredibly uh, superhuman strength and, and things like that. So it's kind of playing off all of that. Um, I mean, mistake is is annoying. I find the character annoying, and I can understand why they wanted to go all Joan Crawford on his ass and get ship him off somewhere because he's an annoying little brat. Um, but it's just another wonderfully bizarre thing for this movie that it could, uh, you, you couldn't you just couldn't make a movie like this now. Well, you could, but you just wouldn't. Um, so having these characters in here, it's 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 so broad the whole thing is so broadly done um that if you're coming to be scared you're not gonna be scared although i think when i read reread my review on history lives i said towards the end i think you can't help i think when you start having uh final girl being chased by killer around a darkened complex or you know you can't help but generate some level of suspense i mean it's very minimal but there's a little bit of it um the gore effects there's some gore effects in there they're, they're not particularly convincing uh there's one half decent one with an eyeball hanging off a face and uh various things like that but also the killer as joe's saying when he he jumps on that guy changing the battery in the car um and he crushes him is kind of probably one of the all-time greatest slasher movie stupid slasher movie deaths so it's it i it's just kind of uh, the whole thing is just ridiculous but it has a certain zany charm to it that unless you're attuned or you you've actually got time for early 80s slash movies uh, most ridiculous and dare i say it most nathan-esque if you don't have patience for that you're not going to like this movie but if you if you have got you know take time to you know enjoy a bad movie and actually watch people probably quite enjoying making a bad movie then there's there's stuff here to um to enjoy so um yeah i enjoyed my revisit to home sweet home it's uh it's one of a kind certainly thank you very much justin eric well, yes, this is an odd one for me as well, because uh, on the surface, this isn't a film I would necessarily feel I would enjoy because it's, um, well, sorry, Nathan, it's a bit Nathan-y. Um, but there's something really quite compelling about Home Sweet Home. Um, and it's probably down to one thing, and that is Mistake, who is one of cinema's greatest sort of WTF characters. I mean, I don't know what whose idea it was to have a guy in my makeup um, who does magic and who likes to play an electric guitar with an amplifier on his back, which I'm assuming he has a battery pack in there as well to, to power it. Uh, and he likes to go around interrupting people having sex by playing his guitar. It's all very, very weird. Um, uh, nobody's mentioned yet the magic, not the magic fountain, but the, the wonderful fountain that appears outside the front door of the house and is um, at the centre of many exciting chase scenes in the film. Um, you see this fountain several times times and you see mistake being chased around this fountain several times and it reminded me of maybe the, like the shoe rack that appears in the massacre series of films by nathan johnson um because <laughs> it's like if nathan was making a benny hill episode <laughs> yes because i lost count of the amount of times that mistake is, is seen ch- being chased around that fountain but uh, i thought the fountain might be a metaphor because we don't see water flowing from the fountain and like water is the symbol of life and the fact that there's no water means that there's death here I love yeah. that. Deep, oh, yes. Deep. So, so um, I was saying to you guys off air, the villain of the piece kind of reminded me of the killer in Final Exam in the way that he's sort of unmasked, but also unexplained. Um, we kind of get a very brief background into um, Jake Seinfeld or Jake, whatever his name is. Um, uh, we see him do some drugs and that's his basis for going berserk and going to kill this, this, this family. Um, he's incredibly muscly. 
And uh, poor Mistake doesn't have a chance. Mistake looks incredibly weedy, so Mistake didn't have a chance, really. Um, the kills, there's lots of variety there, although there's, it's not a special effects heavy film. You don't really see any, you know, Tom Savini moments in there. Uh, you know, there's the electrocution, the guy, as you were mentioning, getting the hood of the car, as you would say in America, uh, crushed onto his head. I mean, I don't know, is he decapitated? I don't think we ever find out really what happens to him. But um, I also love that scene where the old lady is knocked over at the start of the film. Um, I think you, you um, were mentioning in the last podcast, Justin, that it's an old man, or it's a stunt man in a wig. Um, it's it, definitely somebody younger anyway. I don't know if it's male or female, but definitely yeah. somebody younger. In I think I, I misremembered that because you don't actually see the car hitting them, do you? They do that kind of slow-mo, no. speed yeah. up slow-mo kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. There's, yeah, a but, scene, there's a scene early in the film, I'm wondering if Eric and Justin picked up on. They're, they're talking about mistake at the dinner table and they're, they're like preparing dinner and they're like, I think you've been a little too hard on him. Hard on him? <laughs> hard on him? Yeah. Oh, Joseph. Yeah. We're we not that immature. Sure. We wouldn't pick that kind of thing up. Come on. <laughs> um, but after that scene where he knocks the old lady over, I mean, how does he manage to escape scot-free out of the city when his car is covered in blood? It's it's quite bizarre. Um, and <laughs> he actually stops to wash it at one point, so he's kind of conscientious about his. Yeah, uh, I know. But but when he gets to when he gets to the Bradley house, it still has blood stains all over it. And did you notice um, when the blood was kind of, it, it didn't, it, we were putting water on and it wasn't shifting at all. It had dried like nail, nail mm. varnish. <laughs> the one thing I was wondering about, I mean, it was kind of, it was kind of curious that he killed this, uh, this guy, stole his car, and then he mowed down this old lady. But if you watch him after that, he's like, he's actually a very courteous driver. He, he has his hands on the 10 to two positions. <laughs> you know, he, he watches on each turn. So he's a good driver. <laughs> I, I just thought maybe he'd be a crazy driver, but he, he drives like an old lady. Mm, he does. Mm. Um, the other thing that was was bizarre about this film was, is that mistake at one stage runs into his father's bedroom while his father is having well about to have sex with his girlfriend. Um, now that's just weird, and nobody makes a huge deal of it. They're just sort of like, "Oh, mistake! You're up to your old tricks again." It's like, hang on. <laughs> He just walked in and his father having sex. Come on, will somebody please mention this and make a big deal about it? It's it's just <laughs> bizarre. Because, I mean, that time that I walked in on Joseph and Nathan having sex, I felt really <gasps> awkward. Until you joined in. <laughs> hey, yeah, we certainly spit roast Nathan good. Oh, my goodness me. Why do I have to be in the middle? <laughs> Nathan's our little Oreo. How dare yeah. you? How dare you? <laughs> oh yeah, well the middle of Oreos are the best part. Is that Ooh. where all the cream is? Is that why? Oh. <laughs> How dare you. I do like the character of Maria as well. Um she's like one of those deluded um X Factor talent show type contestants who thinks that she can sing, which is actually really awful. Or what I like to call Susie. <gasps> oh for goodness sake. They keep on coming. She's don't like they, the scene. She's like the senorita. She doesn't speak English, so no one. Everyone's telling her she's terrible, and she doesn't understand. Yep. <laughs> and I do love those two women who are lost in the woods, and they've obviously been told to improvise their dialogue, and they just keep talking over each other. Um, it's great. Um, so yeah, it's really an off kilter movie, and it it almost skirts around skullduggery levels of 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 oddness um but it's it's much more cohesive film than skullduggery it is a, a you know a bona fide slasher in that even though it is very strange in places um so i mean despite the fact that it's quite slow and uh, you know the the you know there's just endless scenes of of mistake being chased by people and him doing magic and all that type of thing i still find it really really enjoyable and really watchable um i and as nathan said i love the scene where mistake is face to face with the killer and the killer is holding maria hostage and he says please don't kill her i'll do anything i'll play my guitar i'll sing i can do some magic <laughs> it's like yeah that like that will work um so yeah uh, it's a thumbs up from me as well uh, I would love to see um, maybe Arrow, Scream Factory, 88, one of them get their hands on it because I've only ever seen this in sort of a, a dark VHS print. So I would, you know, I'd like to, and I'd love to hear some of the background to the film and I'd love to, you know, them to interview Mistake as well. That would be great. But yeah. Feels like um, a Vinegar Syndrome type release to me. Yes, it'd be perfect for vin Vinegar Syndrome, actually, now that you mention it. So if yeah. we could get a commentary. Mm. Yes. Yes. Mm. 
Oh, and by the way, the you know the way the killer keeps laughing so much all the way through the film? Is that because he's heard one of my jokes of the week? <laughs> Well, he's well, laughing like he he's la- insane, so... Let's see if he laughs when you tell yours later. Yeah, I bet you he will. So okay. that's my tuppence. Oh, awesome. I like your tuppence. <gasps> well, that's what you said that <laughs> time. <laughs> oh, Nathan. Oh, Nathan. <laughs> oh, Nathan's. Okay. Uh, now, if we all had a mistake in our families... No wonder he acts like that. They named him Mistake. Although although I kind of wonder if his parents were just prescient. But well, possibly. I, I think he's listed in the credits as Mistake Bennett, isn't he? Or Bradley. Brad, yeah. Bradley, sorry. Yeah. Bradley. A very interesting name to give your child. Yeah. Yes. Again, if that is the name that he was given, then I don't really blame him for being annoying to his family. That is true. Although, I wonder, oh, oh I, just had a, I just had an interesting theory. What? Hmm. what? If he is a Mistake... Is that why he's put Tipex all over his face? What? To remove the mistake. What is what is Tipex? Okay. What do you call it? White out, I think you call it in the white Oh, white out, yes. Yes. To remove mistakes. And that's why he's put it on his face to remove the mistake. Ah. Uh, Interesting. It's, 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 these wor- it's these different words that kind of ruin your jokes for me, Eric. But it's not well, it wasn't that. a joke, it was it was an observation. I think if that's it's almost Jean Cocteau, don't you think? Yeah. It's not just Justin, the, the yeah. different words that ruin them, is it? Hey. To be honest. <laughs> so, um, you had some theories, Joseph, didn't you as well? Well, I do, but it's kind of part of my background, which I have a lot of background on this movie, believe it or not. Okay, well, shall we go on to background and talk about that in context? Uh, yes. Nathan, as it's your pick, I'm sure you've got lots. Yes, tell us all your background, Nathan. I do have a little bit of background this time. Oh, okay, that backfired and it's yeah. just... Yes, <laughs> it did rather. Uh, producer Sandy Cove, you know, also produced Terror on Tour to All a Good Night Open House. And I'm pretty sure that movie Demented, although it's not listed on his IMDb page. Speaking of Demented, Sally Young, a.k.a. Sally Elise, who was in this film, uh, played a psychopathic killer in Demented a few a year before. So she went from killer to victim. Quite some um, range. Huh? Quite some range. Yeah, I think so. Uh, speaking of which, just as just a little aside, have you guys seen Demented? No, I haven't. Is it a kind of a rape revenge type movie? Um, yes, but but no. I mean, it's like it's <laughs> it's a rape film, but the people she goes after are not the people that actually did the raping. So, okay, That's, is it? Could it be considered a slasher movie? I think so. I mean, she does like put some meat cleavers and stuff. Uh, you know, sharp implements to good use. Okay. Um, Jake Steinfeld obviously is uh, famous for his body by Jake workouts. Uh, Peter DePaula, mistake, is a magician now and then. Um, and I liked his magic trick in the movie, personally. Um, Vanessa Shaw, she went on to have a pretty decent film career. Um, although I mainly know her from The Hills Have Eyes, Hocus Pocus, and that movie Ladybugs. Rodney Dangerfield. Um, Lisa Rodriguez, who plays Maria here, was also in Terror on Tour as Jane, who was my favorite character in that movie. She was so tough and resourceful. Love that character. Although Jane spoke English throughout. And in this movie, we're led to believe that Maria doesn't speak or understand English, or at least doesn't speak it. Maybe she understands it. I don't know. David Milke, or Milky, I don't know how to say this. Um, he plays Scott, the Final Girl's boyfriend. And Home Sweet Home, um, he only had one other um, acting job from what I could find on the IMDb. He was in T.J. Hooker as Boy George Clone. <laughs> he, he looks he looks exactly like Steve Miner, I think. Yeah, hmm. I love Korea. the scene. I love the scene at the beginning where a mistake comes upon them in the car making out, and he plays his guitar, and, and the guy's like, "Oh, you're so horny! You're so horny!" <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, that is my background. So I shall pass it off to one of you. Okay, I have just a few bits to add to that. Nettie Pena, who is the director of this film, is that is Nettie Pena a female director? She is. Justin, did yes. you say? She is, yeah. So she, and the only other directorial credit I can see on her IMDb is the adult horror movie mashup, uh, Dracula Sucks, starring uh, Jamie Gillis, which was made the year before this. 
Um, Thomas Bush, who wrote the screenplay, according to IMDb, went on to work on the sound department for Evil Dead 2. Uh, Vanessa Shaw, you mentioned uh, earlier there, Nathan, she was also in Eyes Wide Shut, which is a Rudy movie by Stanley Kubrick with lots of Rudy, nudie people in it. Um, let's see. Uh, Peter DePaula, who is the magician, as you said, uh, who plays Mistake, he was also played a mime artist in an episode of Wonder Woman. So he had great range as well. Um, yeah, mine was his thing. Uh, and Don Edmonds, did you mention Don Edmonds, Nathan? I did not. No. Okay, so Don Edmonds plays, um, is it Harold Bradley, the the father in the film? Yes. Uh, he he directed the first two Ilsa movies, which was She-Wolf of the SS and Harem Keeper of the Oil Sheiks. And he also directed Terror on Tour, which I have seen, but I can't remember anything about it. But it also but it features people in my makeup with electric guitars. So he had great range as well. Um, and he was a producer as well on films like Beyond Evil, Skeeter. And I find this difficult to believe, True Romance, the, you know, the... Tarantino um, scripted movie from 1993. Love, um, love that film. Yes. So I haven't seen it since it came out in the cinema. Does it hold up mm. well? Oh, it's yeah. so good. I love it. Mm. Mm. Uh, Jake Steinfeld, as you said, famous for Body by Jake, which means nothing really to myself and Justin, I would say. I'd say that's a, a exclusively US thing. Did you ever hear of Body by Jake? Only Justin, in the, the context know. of this movie, so yeah, yeah, that's the same at me, yeah. But as you said, his CV includes uh, roles and things like The Money Pit, Coming to America. Uh, he had a voice role in the Disney movie Ratatouille recently, uh, and uh, he was only—he's actually only twenty-two or twenty-three when he filmed this, but I think he looks considerably older. But uh, he also trained Harrison Ford on the second and third Indiana Jones movies for, um, you know, uh, to build his body up. Um, uh, some of the AKAs for the film, Slasher in the House, uh, Blood Party was another one. It's known on Mexican video as Quien Sera el Asesino, which translates as Who Will Be the Murderer. Ooh. Um, it's and fairly that obvious, is, isn't it? Sorry? It's fairly obvious. It's fairly, it is fairly obvious. Yeah, actually, now that I think of it, it's so obvious. Who will be the murderer? Well, the guy that's going around killing people, probably. Yes. Um, yeah, so that's all the background I have. Okay, thank you. How about you, Joseph? Well, you guys have pretty much read through everything I had, except for um, Eric, you mentioned the, the writer, Thomas Bush. I was looking at his filmography, and it's kind of strange because the, the, the IMDb has a thanks credit for him as a, um, and a memory of dedicatee at the end of the Home Sweet Home. Hmm. I, I saw never that, watched yeah. I've, I've never watched the credits, so I've never, you know, I've never felt the need to watch the credits. But uh, there's no date of death or even any indication that he, you know, he is dead on that page as far as I could tell. Um, and the name is so generalized, you know, Google was no help. So, you know, no yeah. big deal. I thought, I thought maybe his death details were just never added. But then you look at his filmography, um, it would indicate that Home Sweet Home was his last credit, except for two sound credits for Evil Dead 2 and not since Casanova in 87 and 88. So it's, I think it's like, it's probably a different person with the same name yeah. on the IMDb. But I have this theory that I think he saw the rough cut of Home Sweet Home. He was mortified and faked his own death. And eventually you know, he went on to glossier <laughs> pastures, but his little ruse was discovered. Well, I, th- I thought that it was either that or he was, um, it was in memory of his career, um, the credit. <laughs> The um, the film is set in California. Now, I'm not sure where it was filmed, but I am. If I had to guess, I'm going to say Southern California, like San Diego, like far, far South California. Because um, if you look at this movie, um, first off, the Bradleys look kind of um, Mexican in heritage. I'll just say they they kind of look. I think they they are mistake. The wife, the dad, they all have that dark skin, the, the, the black hair, and they live in this huge kind of ranch out in the middle of nowhere in California that's very Tuscany looking almost. Um, and yet they have a blonde daughter named Angel. Now, how do they have a blonde daughter? I think Angel was kidnapped, and I think the Bradleys are part of the cartel. Oh. I think so. And she's always so mopey, like she's been kidnapped. And the only person she really, you know, talks to his mistake and i think mistake feels bad that you know this little girl was kidnapped in the cartel so i think angel is um looking for her real family oh wow maybe the fountain outside symbolizes a kidnapped child <laughs> mm, could be. that's my name theory yeah, yeah. i wow, think I'm the so girlfriend cool. probably adopted her at the end you know and they lived happily ever after yeah 
But that's all the background I have. Okay. Well, yes, yeah, so I'm looking at the end. Uh, well, I'm looking at the end credits now, and it does say dedicated in memory of Thomas Bush, who was also credited as the first assistant director on the film. So it has surely it can't be the same guy who who rose from the dead and uh, did the Zaf sound on Evil Dead Two. Mm. Now, if his name was like Frank Glubelglander, you'd be easier to find. But Thomas Bush is kind of a common don't, name, sort of. Don't talk Maybe to me about Frank Glubelglander. I'm Frank sorry. Glubelgland, I, he he broke my heart. I. Don't hear his name mentioned ever again, okay? Yeah, we know what he did to you, Eric. Yeah, last summer. Oh, right. Okay, well, I've got a few other bits we haven't uh, touched on, as it were. Is that, yes, it was one of the very few early 80s slash movies directed by a woman. Um, Betty Benya, as I, you mentioned, Eric, got her start in the, well, got her theatrical start in Dracula Sucks, which was a, I'd looked it up because I wasn't sure if it was a, it was a hardcore Bourne movie, but it was. It was like with uh, Jamie Gillis, you said, and John Holmes and <clears throat> Seeker and or Seca and various other um, Bourne legends from the late 70s, early 80s. Um, and she was the editor and uh, producer of that movie. Um, she's actually gone on to be a very successful stills photographer, and she still uh, does stuff now, even though she must be in her late 70s, I'm going to guess now. Um, I did actually get in contact with her a few years ago, uh, on Facebook and she did respond saying it might be fun to talk about the movie um, and I cont- contacted her again recently uh, and she didn't get back to me so uh, you know whether or not she ever talks about this movie I don't know but uh, um, I found a credit for somebody who had a very similar na- uh, similar it was the same name but with a um, an added middle name that was had worked on experimental movies with the doors in 1966 and uh filmed her ucla uh, uh student film was the wonderful world of wigs which sounds uh marvelous Ooh. i mean if this is california and it's ucla and has that whole porn passed around the door it'd probably be her actually yeah i would have thought so so um but yeah maybe one day hopefully uh, I'll have a chance to chat with her. But uh, uh, the copyright details on the film, when it comes up, it says 1980, which kind of makes sense. I think the film, you see, whether or not actually got a theatrical release, I believe it did get some kind of theatrical release because certainly there is a US one sheet for for the movie. Uh, And IMDb uh, sort of says it, it was released theatrically in December of 1981. Um, I d- doubt it got released uh, massively, but certainly this was a movie that was made around the same time. And I, in fact, I think I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if it was made back to back with Terror on Tour, because certainly it shares, you know, some of the cast and uh, I think some of the people behind the scenes. Now, Don Edmonds is kind of an interesting character because obviously he was in this, and of course he's. I think as Eric mentioned, he became notorious as director of Ilsa. Uh, one of the Ilsa movies, I think, is Ilsa Harim Keeper of the All Sheiks. Um, yeah, it was the first two. He was did. the first both, two? Oh, both, two of them. Both, yeah. Okay. Um, but uh, I'm shocked that he was the director of Terror on Tour. Was you yeah. said he was? Well, I had no idea. Well, it's interesting that it's, it's said that um, he would been hired by Sandy Cobe who to to make some as he turned real quickies. And there was a couple there was a couple of interviews uh, with Don Edmonds in uh, I think one was in Fangoria and one was in another uh, older magazine. He passed away I think in two thousand and nine. I might be wrong on that, but uh, um, uh, before he passed away, and he said um, to quote uh, Sandy Cobe came to him and said, "Here's four dollars. Go make a movie." Uh, and he said that Terror on Tour was made in six days and Home, Sweet Home was made in four days. And he said um, Jake Steinfeld came in for the audition, um, but then he went and said he'd probably deny it now. Uh, and uh, the, when uh, Van Gogh asked him about the films, the exact quote he said, terrible, awful, oh God, please. So obviously not necessarily fond memories from Don Edmonds for that uh, for that one. Um the, no, wait a minute. Is hmm. Jake Steinfeld the one who doesn't like this, or are Don Edmonds, or both? Well, Don Edmonds, I, I read somewhere else that uh, he, um, uh, Adam Rockoff, who wrote um, the uh, Going to Pieces slash a movie book uh, a long time ago, he's got another book out, uh, uh, which I can't remember the name of now, but the quote from him saying he was talking about, um, about his experience as a slash movie fan, which I need to pick up. 
Um, uh, and a quote here, he says, for being so irredeemably terrible, Home Sweet Home has a strangely compelling pedigree. I've heard that star Steinfeld has no sense of humour about the involvement with the film, which makes watching this travesty almost worthwhile. So whether or not it means he thinks his performance are fantastic or he doesn't laugh, he doesn't laugh at himself. He does a Faye Dunaway, a Mommy Dearest type kind of um, not wanting to uh, enjoy the ridicule. I don't know. But uh, um, but the film was put out by Intercontinental Releasing Corporation, as I think, Nathan, you you, you mentioned, uh, put out uh, Demented, Open House, Terror at Red Wolf Inn. Uh, to All a Good Night, Terror on Tour, Evil Judgment, which is 1984, but I think it was made a lot earlier, which is a cool little killer judge movie, if I remember. Um, and it was put out as a co-production with Movie Anonymous Partnership, who only made this one movie. It certainly de- definitely got a release in Mexico, because I used to. I think I still have got Mexican lobby cards for this movie. Um, so, uh, and <laughs> the film... <laughs> and there goes my, it goes along with my, um, my cartel theory. <laughs> well of course yes um the film although it wasn't prosecuted as a video nasty it was seized and confiscated in the uk under the so-called section three of the obscene publications act uh during the video nasty uh um, the panic um now the only other thing i've got i think we've mentioned all about the um, alternative titles alternative titles i've seen on the B- uh, british british film institute of all places were slasher in the house thanksgiving and thanksgiving day which i think is slightly different to the ones um you mentioned that you mentioned blood party as another yeah potential. we got we got slasher in the house on like an ep tape i don't remember who put it out it was like some cheapy but um the home sweet home was on media so it got all the yeah. bells and whistles of vhs slasher in the house was put out by new pacific pictures that's right yeah it has a big hat like a big yeah. purple house and lightning and that's it yeah so that's, 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 that's about the it the the artwork on the media with the knife and the blood and the house kind of the final exam yeah. sort of style art to me that's a better um artwork than the one for slasher in the house i like the who wants to see home better as well mm. does anyone want to see my big purple house <laughs> no thank you <laughs> no thanks barney is there a slasher <laughs> in it yeah <sighs> okay. anyway, one last one last thing before we descend into uh, uh eric's joke of the week is um there bizarrely when i looked for like uh, i couldn't find any reviews of this movie which isn't that massively surprising but there was some press on the movie and it was all around jake steinfeld because uh, even at the time he was a celebrity uh sort of bodybuilder to the stars i kind of guess and um, I found in one Australian newspaper and another one called The Advocate's Son, um, I'm not sure where that was from, and the title is Muscle Man Plays Killer. And it says, uh, it's very short, it says, Hollywood, Jake Steinfeld, formerly Mr. Southern California and Mr. New York in bodybuilding competition, plays a psychopathic killer in a new horror film called Home Sweet Home. When he's not acting and building his body, he works with such performers as Keith Carradine, Sharon Farrell and Colin Camp to keep them in shape. So there you go. Uh, and that was from November 1981, which kind of uh, is in line with the uh, the film being released in December of 1981. So You got to, uh, you get to work out with Colleen Camp back in her prime days? Ooh, sounds like man. it, yes. So, yes, well, that's all the background uh, I think I've got on Home Sweet Home. It's a, Again, I'd love to speak to people involved in this. It sounds, if I don't know whether Don Edmonds was being... Um, uh sarcastic about saying that this film was made in four days but i could possibly see that happening i don't know it was obviously a quickie that was turned around uh very quickly it looks it doesn't look like a four day film though that's no. more of a night to dismember type movie this is yeah this looks like I, a solid two weeks at least he's probably misremembering it or certainly sort of knowing that it was just like a, it, it was just put out very very quickly but it sounds like 1980 was like a bit of a powerhouse for these kind of cheapy films you know uh it's all a good night and terror on tour and home sweet home it seems like they were probably all made by sandy cobe to cash in on the slash movie boom uh which was um presumably all in the wake of friday 13th although i don't know exactly when this movie was made i can't find any exact information but i would i would hazard a guess that it was um, made in 1980 because that's the copyright date on the uh, on the actual film so so 
considering it's California and they're all kind of wearing heavier clothing, I would say mm-hmm. it would be the fall of 1980 since it was released in 81. If it was a four-day turnaround time, that would make sense. I reckon you're right. And that's probably – so it's probably all made to cash in on Friday the 13th, wasn't it? And um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean you don't really wear he- heavy clothing in California unless the weather's a little cool. And it typically does not get cool there unless it is the very end of the year. So Exactly, exactly. So – well, have we got any feedback on the movie from the forums? Yeah, uh, our social media, Nathan will like this. Um, our social media presence, it looks like 70% of our audience enjoyed Home Sweet Home, Nathan. Only 30% disliked it. Oh, that's way better than I expected. Now, uh, Jeremy Ball, he likes the film. He says, is it good? No. Is it fun? Hell yeah. Forget the Body by Jake videos. For my money, this is Jake Steinfeld's greatest gift of the world. As the killer, he's over the top. Mindlessly batshit crazy in a way I get a big kick out of. As for mistake, well, that's one can of worms I won't open since I'm sure everyone else will. Can't wait to hear your thoughts. That was from Jeremy Ball. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy. You're our listener of the week. Fantastic. Or one of them. Uh, Robert Long, he does not like the film, as far as I can tell. He says, the VHS was dark as shit, banal, annoying mime electrical guitar playing. And I wonder if the filmmakers were on meth. That would kind of tie into the cartel angle there, Robert. (laughs) Um, It looked cheap as hell. Uh, That's Robert Long, who's also our disliking listener of the week. Thank you. And, um, well, you know how to get in contact with the show. And if you don't... Oh, Oh, I heard that. What was that? What was that? It's a mistake. mistake. (laughs) <laughs> Eric, is your is your soundboard working? No, I had this on my phone. I put a clip of uh, mistake on my phone. Yeah. As you we do. are working on the soundboard issues, by the way. Yes, we. Harold's they... plops and our needs come back. <laughs> no, they don't. They so, don't. Everyone has been emailing us asking for Harold's plops. No, yeah. although that does give me an idea. I miss Daniela. Yeah, yeah. You whore. <laughs> Go fuck yourself. I hate you. You, you need to get that on your phone so at least you can play it somewhat. True. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's time for your joke of the week, Eric. So mm-hmm. here you go. It's my joke of the week. It's so, so fantastic. Okay. Chocks away. Okay, so I was at the casino the other night and I had completely run out of chips and I had no money left. So I bet my mime artist magician friend who also likes to play his electric guitar. Yes, that was my stake. That was my stake. <laughs> Thank you. I liked it. I liked it. Thank you, Joseph. Yes, well done, Eric. That wasn't your worst. Thank you. It was very inspired. <laughs> Thank you. So, Boomer well, or Axel agree. Yes. Well, is that... Um, it's Boomer. Is there anything left for us to say? Or is that, are we... I think that's about Static it. Static is the greatest fictional character of all time. <laughs> <laughs> I said it. Yeah. Well, hopefully, yeah. Um, as we have mentioned before, uh, we have... Well, we've got... Uh, uh coming up next time is the 200th episode of the hysteria continues can you believe it we've been uh, we've been uh mining this same furrow for the last what how long is we're gonna have our ninth birthdays coming up in january and as i mentioned we have a yes. special show planned for that it was meant to be coming out next time but um we need to we've got some extra special things happening with that uh so hopefully it'll be worth your while but uh in the meantime let's hope it's not a mistake and i as i teased at the beginning of the show it's a film that um eric you were convinced we'd cover this weren't you we have i know we've covered it you can't tell me we haven't because we have <laughs> well we'll be covering it again because um yeah you know is a Mario Barber's Blood and Black Lace. So for the 200th episode, we're going to be um, looking at the movie, which maybe wasn't the very first Jalo, but was certainly probably uh, the most influential Jalo of those very early films uh, on the later uh, sort of uh, Jalos, uh, Jali in Italy, and also uh, arguably on films like John Carpenter's Halloween and other slasher movies in North America in the uh, in the uh, late seventies and early eighties. So, join us next time uh, when we take a trip back over to Italy for Maria Bava's Blood and Black Lace. So, what are we playing out with, 
apart from well don't space. forget don't forget for you that um we can't announce it yet but we also have a christmas a very special christmas episode coming up that i think you guys will enjoy exactly yes and we'll be we'll be announcing that at the end of the next episode won't we mm-hmm. yes okay right so plenty more to come and also of course we have our patreon we have um we are this month are going to be going to be uh tackling silver bullet aren't we yeah and the top 10 horror films from 1981 top three Top three, yeah. Top, top, top ten. ten. I don't think we can do top ten. No. We have thirty of them here. No, forty. Technically, it would be twelve. So right, close enough. Yeah. So my cat just um, Argento just pressed the mute button there, but I think I understood most of that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be fun. Yeah. So, yeah, so we'll look forward to that. And uh, uh, if you'd like to support us with Patreon, we like that very much. And uh, you can do that for as little as a dollar a month, I believe. Is that right, Joseph? Well, it's like a little as a dollar per episode. So you're paying like two dollars or a little something around there per month i know and but you can set a cap on you can set a cap so you can only pay a dollar but yeah i mean it's just a dollar i mean it's just a dollar for quality missing. entertainment 40, like this we got 40 plus episodes that you can't hear unless you sign up and they're and you know it's it's a good incentive to sign up exactly so okay right and sorry did we say what we're playing out with uh apart from mistake well it's uh nathan's choice so nathan what do you want to hear um <laughs> There's a song called Home Sweet Home, so we could go Motley with that. Crew. Motley yes. Crew. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll play out with that. And uh, yeah, we'll look forward to uh, welcoming you to the fashion house in Italy uh, where the models are dying to get ahead. So yeah, uh, say goodbye to the good people. Bye. Bye, good people. Bye. I'll play my guitar for you. <laughs> you want a beer? Some magic. <laughs> Home Sweet Home.